And I'll invite you to turn in your catechism to question number 62. We'll also have a couple of scripture readings that I'll announce in a moment. But first we'll do some review in the catechism. We're continuing in the Westminster Shorter Catechism with the questions that have to do with the fourth commandment. So I think it would be helpful for us to, since this is, our, this is actually our last time with the fourth commandment, so let's review all the questions that have to do with the fourth commandment. It will serve as a review and it will also uh, help anyone that, that might not have been with us for all these studies to, to see the overall teaching of the catechism about the fourth commandment. So let's confess these together. We'll start actually with question number 57, which simply asks, which is the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. <clears throat> okay, when we did that question you may remember I gave you an overview on the whole scope of the fourth commandment. We kind of looked at the whole thing. Then uh, the next question that we have is question 58. What is required in the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment requireth the keeping holy to God such set times as he hath appointed in his word, expressly one whole day in seven, to be a holy Sabbath to himself. This is the moral requirement of that commandment. We're to keep the days that God appointed. That's the moral thing that we're to do. And in particular, the moral requirement is one day in seven. The sermon about this was simply an exhortation to keep the day that God appointed holy. That was basically what I did in, in, with that question. Now we, the next one is question 59. Which day of the seven hath God appointed to be the weekly Sabbath? From the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ, God appointed the seventh day of the week to be the weekly Sabbath and the first day of the week ever since to continue to the end of the world, which is the Christian Sabbath. So we looked at, when we looked at this, we saw how Jesus set a pattern for keeping the Sabbath on the first day of the week. It was done more by his action, by what he did, than by his precept, by what he said. He had the, new, he had the first New Testament worship service with his disciples on the very day that he rose. And of course, that day was Sunday, the first day of the week. In that service, he preached the good news to his disciples, and that led them to praise God and thank God for what he had done, for hearing him when he cried, cried out as our Redeemer. And then he commissioned and empowered them to be ministers of the gospel, sending them forth to preach. He met with them again the following Sunday for the second New Testament worship service with him, and he essentially did the same thing. And then at Pentecost, which is always on Sunday, first day of the week, he poured out his spirit so that on that day, on the Lord's day, they preached the gospel and they led people in praise in Jesus' name. The things that we do on the Lord's day in remembrance of Christ. We saw that this pattern was followed by the apostles in establishing New Testament churches such that the churches under their care made it the practice to worship on the first day of the week. So we understand that what the apostles did was the command of the Lord and that it was normative, meaning that it applies to us as a commandment from God. 
So we saw this pattern in Acts 20, verse 7, for example, with the church of Troas, where Paul waited until the church was assembling together on the first day of the week to break bread, and then he preached to them. So that shows us the change of day that occurs. Um, We saw that Jesus did all those things on the first day of the week, and then that there was the um, practice of the churches on the, with the first day. And there's never really, I mentioned to you, there's never really been any dispute about that, that, you know, this was clear that, yeah, Jesus rose on the first day. And from the beginning, the New Testament church, they never really debated about whether they should keep that day or not. They just, they, they did it. It was just, it came from the apostles. It just continued on. They had to debate about whether they also should keep the, the uh, seventh day of the week as well. But uh, that went along with the circumcision debate and all of that. Okay, now uh, let's confess question number 60, which asks us, that's the one we looked at last week, how is the Sabbath to be sanctified? The Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day, even from such worldly employments and recreations as are lawful on other days, and in spending the whole time in the public and private exercises of God's worship, except so much as is to be taken up with the works of necessity and mercy. Now, when we looked at this question, we looked especially at what God calls us to do to keep his Sabbaths, as is seen in Leviticus 23. And we saw that as a holy day, it is to be a day for the worship of God, where we rest from our regular activities so that we might worship. We saw that it is to be a joyful feast day and a day when we assemble with others for worship. A holy convocation, it said, having a gathering for worship in all of our communities. That's what we're to do. I made a mistake a minute ago when I said that we did this last week. That was two weeks ago that we did that one. Uh, Question number... um, number 60, looking at how the day is to be kept special. So we looked at the positive things that we do on that day. You know, the holy convocation, that's the assembly of God's people. That's where it was first appointed, and and now we continue to do that to this day. Then uh, question 61, that's the one we did last week. What is forbidden in the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment forbiddeth the omission or careless performance of the duties required and the profaning the day by idleness or doing that which is in itself sinful or by unnecessary thoughts, words, or works about our worldly employments or recreations. So with that question, we looked at the various ways that we profane the Sabbath That is ways that, remember what it means to profane it, to make it like every other day. We make it just like another ordinary day of the week instead of keeping it holy as God commands. So we profane a holy thing, making it like it's everything else, not holy. We looked at three ways that we do profane it. By working, by doing our regular servile work by doing all sorts of other things that have nothing to do with worshiping God, okay, our recreations and things like that, and by making it into a day of oppressive regulations in an attempt to be super spiritual the way the Pharisees did, legalists. Jesus made it clear that we can do works of necessity like fixing lunch and works of mercy like helping an injured person, He showed us how to keep the Sabbath properly because he wasn't abolishing it. If he'd been abolishing it, he would have done like he did with all the food laws. He would have said, oh, well, you know, everything's going to be clean. You know, we don't need to basically worry about that. But with the Sabbath, he didn't do that at all. He said, no, this is, I'm going to show you how it should be kept. You've not been doing it right. This is how it should be done because he was preparing it for the people of his kingdom. Okay, well, all that brings us now to question number 62. And uh, we, will, we will say that one in a few minutes together. But first, um, I want to look at a few things by way of introduction. In question 62, 
we look at the reasons that the Lord has given us for keeping this commandment. He encourages us to keep it by giving us reasons to keep it. Of course, God doesn't need to do that. He can just say, hey, that's my command. That's, that's enough, isn't it? But because he condescends to us in our weakness and he comes and says, hey, here's, here's some good reasons for you to think about for keeping it. These reasons are spelled out by him, the fourth commandment itself. So I want to read that to you from Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11 for our scripture reading. So we've read it, of course, before, but especially looking at the reasons now that we see in this very commandment. I'll give your attention. This is God's word beginning in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to look at, the, at four different reasons that are in that uh, commandment of reasons that we should keep it. You can see in this commandment how the Lord not only tells us to keep the Sabbath day holy, but how he also gives us reasons. Now, the primary reason, of course, is one that we know. Uh, we wouldn't have a or we would have um, a holy day with no known reason for it, <laughs> um, which would be kind of a silly thing. We must know that it is a day to commemorate his work of creation. And uh, the reason, that reason is included that he made the world. And of course, uh, we've seen also that it includes redemption. The Lord also gives us reasons, though, besides that, to motivate us to keep the Sabbath. As he knows what a problem it has been for us since the fall like we've always had trouble people always had trouble keeping the sabbath so he does the part of a tender parent to to help us children if your mother knows that you have a hard time obeying something that she has asked you to do something that's hard to do then sometimes she'll give you additional reasons additional reasons to keep it besides just that she told you to do it you know, wipe the counters or we're, we'll have problems with ants in our house again or something. She might say something like that. Or uh, you'll get things on your books when you're, when you're studying and there's all this sticky stuff all over the table. Or she, she might give you reasons like that to, to encourage you to, to um, do what you're supposed to do. So question 62 in our catechism spells out these, um, these reasons that God has given in the fourth commandment. So let's confess this question now, the answer to this question. Question 62 What are the reasons annexed to the fourth commandment? The reasons annexed to the fourth commandment are God's allowing us six days of the week for our own employments, his challenging a special propriety in the seventh, his own example, and his blessing the Sabbath day. Now you can see those four reasons that there are four mentioned here. First, God's allowing us six days of the week for our own employments. The commandment says very plainly, six days you shall labor and do all your work. In other words, the point here, you have plenty of time to do everything that you need to do. You've got six days to do all of your work. So it shouldn't be burdensome for you to set aside one day out of the seven days of the week. Second thing is his challenging a special propriety in the seventh. Now that might cause us to say, what is that talking about? Well, that means that God claims special ownership of the day. Propriety is ownership. So the Lord claims that the Sabbath is his holy day. The point here is that the day does not belong to you to do whatever you might think is something you want to do on the day, but it belongs to God as a day for us to worship him. It was made for us as a day of rest from our regular work that we might worship God. Third, his own example, where it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rested on the seventh day. 
we follow his example, the pattern that he gave us of resting on the seventh day, of working all week and then resting and resting to what? His example, why did he rest? To rejoice in the works that he had completed. So we then enter into that joy and rejoicing of the works that God has completed. And then fourth, we keep it, it says, because of his blessing of the Sabbath day. This is a great motivation for us to keep it. If we keep it, then we'll be blessed. As we've seen, when God blesses the day, he doesn't do it for the sake of the day. Days don't need to be blessed for their own sake. A day doesn't know the difference of whether it was blessed or not. When God blesses a day, it means that he blesses it for those who are reasonable creatures who have the ability to reason that uh, they receive blessing from that day from God. Our lives are marvelously enriched and blessed when we keep the day. It does not harm us to uh, deprive ourselves of our labor and our recreations on that day if we follow what God has given us to do in worshiping him and looking to him, it rather enriches us than taking something away from us. So that's a summary of the four reasons that we have for keeping the Sabbath day holy. Now let's look at each of these reasons in more detail. Okay, that was just to lay out a summary. So the first reason, because of God's allowing us six days for our own employments. Again, verse nine, six days you shall labor and do all your work. A lot of people will tell you that they can't keep the Sabbath day because they have too much to do. You know, oh, I've just got so much to do. I I can't do that. I think a lot of people are sort of proud about having a lot to do. You know, it's a way of saying, um, I'm such an important person and I'm in such demand and the things I'm doing are so important that I don't even have time for God's day. You know, I'm such, such an important person. The farmer insists that you know, he's got to get his crop in. It is so important. Or the CEO insists that he's got a meeting that he simply cannot miss. People like that will often say this about other things as well, such as, you know, you can tell them that, you know, you went fishing or you watched a movie or something like, oh, I don't have time for that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've got such important things to do. I don't have time. Um, but before you pat yourself on the back and say, well, I'm not like that. <laughs> then uh, I need to tell you that there are perhaps even more people who don't have time for the Sabbath because they're so busy with recreations. (laughs) They act as though their ball games and their are non-negotiable activities or their hobbies or their television shows or their computer games or whatever. There's absolutely, that's gonna be done no matter what. I'm not even talking about doing them on the Sabbath. I'm talking about doing them on the other six days. And all these things that you absolutely have to do that are not, they're just recreations that they make priorities. And then when Sunday comes around, oh, I've got so much work to do. I don't have time. Well, why do you not have time? It's because you were doing all this other stuff. Like you were overdoing it on the recreation thing. So you've got the, the guy that's the hard-boiled guy that's working all the time. Oh, I don't have time to do anything. And he, he wants to blow off the Sabbath. And then you have the... Uh, the other one that's like just goofing off all week and then, oh man, I've got to get, I've got a test on Monday. I haven't even started studying yet, you know, or, or whatever. That's the kind of thing that, uh, so, so we, we err in various ways. Sometimes people are just lazy and never get their work done because, you know, they, they, they don't work when it's time to work. If you ask them, they would say that their naps or their social media or their shopping or they're spending lots of time hanging out with their friends or, or, you know, they wouldn't say that they're non-negotiable activities altogether, but, but they, would, they would admit that they're not that important. But they gravitate to these things just without thinking about it, right? They just fill up their life with these things, and then they don't have time to worship God. Such people need to face the fact that they're setting those things above God, even though they would never say they were setting them above God. They, in fact, are by default, And there's the kind of laziness where you take two hours to wash the dishes because you don't like washing dishes. And so you're there kind of, you know, and you're you're kind of peddling around and you you don't guess you don't go on and get it done because you're kind of rebelling. You don't like doing it. It's like like Israel, you know, they they took 40 years to come across the wilderness. It wasn't supposed to take that long. (laughs) No, that was because God punished them. But you, you know 
what I'm talking about. When there's work to be done, you can drag it out all day. And, uh, and then you're overwhelmed. I don't have enough time. The problem here in every case, every case, is idolatry. If you don't have time for the Sabbath, it's because of idolatry. Often when people start to seriously observe the Sabbath, it actually exposes their idolatry, the idolatry in their lives. An idol, you know, is something that you devote your life to instead of God. So the CEO thought his big contract gave him good reason to break the Sabbath till he sees how idolatrous that was. A $5 billion contract is not nearly as important as honoring the Lord's Day. We need to remember that. You're not so, your work is not so important. Dr. Piper, Joey Piper, tells of the great love that he had for football that he found out to be, he didn't know it was, but he found it to be an idolatrous love when they started playing games on the Lord's Day. Because before that, they didn't play games on the Lord's Day, and he loved his football, and he would enjoy it. He writes about this in his book. But then, he, you see, he was committed to keeping the Lord's Day, and it wasn't a problem. But then when they started playing on the Lord's Day, he didn't want to, <laughs> he didn't want to keep the Sabbath anymore, uh, in a way. I mean, he still did, and he did keep it, but he found it hard to let it go because he was clinging to that thing more than he thought he was. And that's, that, that's something, if you start keeping the Sabbath, you'll see that there's stuff that you're, you're holding on to that you really are holding on to too tightly. When your idolatry is exposed like this, you see your selfishness in other areas. You see, exam, you see for example, how your love for your idols was robbing affection that should have been given to your spouse or to your children. You're stealing time or money from them because of the thing that is an idol to you. And as soon as you give it up for the Lord's Day, you realize, hey, you know what? This was keeping me from other things that are important that God has given me to do. Last week, we saw how the person who is so covetous that he can't set apart the Sabbath day is also the person, you remember what Amos said? The one who cheats and oppresses the people that work for them. They don't pay them proper wages. They give them um, excessive work to do. Part of this is seen in demanding that they work for him on the Sabbath day. His prophets are more important than giving time off work to worship God to those who work for him. So don't complain that you don't have enough time. You have six days just like everyone else to do what you need to do. You know what? I hate that comment because that's something I complain about. Oh, I don't have enough time. I I don't like that, but I need that. I need to hear that. God has given you those six days to do all your work. If he had given you an eight-day week, you know what you'd do? Exactly the same thing. You would fill up everything, and then you'd say, oh, I don't have enough time. I've only got eight days a week. You know, and people say, eight days? I thought we only had seven. Oh, well, it changed. You know, it, didn't, it won't make any difference. You'll still be the same way. An idolatrous heart is a heart that never has enough. You could make it 10 days and it would still be the same. It's never grateful because it always wants more, 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 more. It's like a glutton. You know, people say, he really loves food. You know what the truth is about a glutton? He doesn't love food. He he doesn't love it at all. He constantly craves it and he's never satisfied with it. If he was satisfied, if he enjoyed it, then he would eat it and say, hey, that was really great. Give thanks to God and be done. But if he's not satisfied ever, then he's just thinking about the next meal, even while he's finishing off the one that he's presently eating. He needs to give thanks to God. Okay, now let's look at the second reason for keeping the Sabbath day, because God has challenged a special propriety for keeping the Sabbath day. He has challenged a special propriety in it. As as I mentioned before, that means that the day belongs to him that the word propriety means ownership. Now, where do we see that in the text itself? Well, God claims special ownership of the day when he says of the Sabbath that it is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. That's ownership. It's his Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord your God, his holy day. This is something that's emphasized throughout Scripture. For example, in Isaiah 58, 13, the Lord rebukes those who find their pleasure 
On what day? On my holy day, the Lord says. He calls it his own day, the day that belongs to him in the special way. He has a special ownership of that day. He owns all the days, but a special ownership of that. In Leviticus 19.3, 19.30, and 26.2, he says to his people, you shall keep my Sabbaths. Here again, it is a day that is his day. When we look at the New Testament, we find the same thing. Last week, we saw in Matthew 12 how the Pharisees were accusing Jesus, Jesus of all people, of breaking the Sabbath because he didn't keep all of their little rules that they had made that, didn't, that God hadn't made. And Jesus told them that he, the Son of Man, was what? Lord of the Sabbath. He owns the Sabbath. If you're the Lord of something, it means it belongs to you. If you're the Lord, if someone goes to a, a property, a great property, and they say, who is the Lord of this land? And the one that comes and says, I am. He's the owner. If you're the Lord, it means it belongs to you. It is in your, at your service to do with as you wish. It is for this reason that in the time of the apostles, that uh, they referred to the Christian Sabbath as what? The Lord's Day. We know this from history, and we have proof of it in the Scripture in Revelation 1.10, where the Apostle John says, I was in the Spirit on what day? The Lord's Day. The day that he has a special propriety in. It wasn't any day. It was the Lord's Day. A day that belongs to the Lord. The Sabbath of the Lord your God. You could call the Old Testament Uh, In the Old Testament, you could call the seventh day the Lord's Day. But uh, it's especially, we often use it to distinguish the Christian Sabbath. We call it the Lord's Day because that's when Jesus, the Lord, rose from the dead, the one that we call Lord especially. But in the Old Testament, too, the, the seventh day was the Lord's Day. Anyway, now if it belongs to Him, you ought to use it in the way that He wants. It's His day. But you don't take something that belongs to somebody else and do what you want with it, do you? So uh, by observing the day, you show that he's your Lord. You do not do your own thing on his day, but you do what he wants you to do on his day because he's your master. And you always do what he wants because he's your master. So in Exodus 31, 13, he tells us that keeping the day shows that we belong to him. Shows that the day belongs to him, but since the day belongs to him, it shows that we belong to him. It says, Exodus 31, 13, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Do you see how that works? When you use this day for the worship of God, you declare to your family, you declare to your friends, to those that you work with, that you belong to the Lord. You keep the day because you belong to the Lord and it is his day. If they try to draw you away and urge you to work or to enter into recreations that are inappropriate uh, for God's holy day, then they find out who your master is. You see, you show them who is your Lord. Your unbelieving mother can try to pressure you to go to the fair or go shopping with her or whatever it might be. She can tell you that you do not love her, that you are selfish, that you are legalistic, that you are narrow, a, a narrow fundamentalist wacko, whatever she wants to say, but she cannot manipulate you because your Lord is the Lord. It's not her, it's the Lord. You show her that this day is non-negotiable because the Lord is your master. And what he says is non-negotiable. You have been given orders from him. He has commanded you to give this day to him, not to your mother, not to someone else. It is his will you do, not someone else's will. And Sabbath keeping is not only a sign to others that you belong to the Lord. It is also a sign to you that you belong to him. As it says in 1 John 2, 3 through 4, by this we know that we know him 
Okay, we know that we belong to Jesus if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. When you keep God's day, you assure yourself that you belong to him. The reason that you keep it, that you can see in yourself, is because he's your Lord and master. Now, at this point, someone will usually say, well, what about the other days? Don't they belong to God too? Don't they belong to the Lord too? Is Jesus not Lord of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, as well as Sunday? And the answer is, of course he is. He is your Lord. You do what he wants you to do every day of the week if he's your Lord. And that includes Sunday. And on Sunday, he wants you to set apart the day as holy as a day of worship. By observing as a day that is visibly distinct from the other days, you show that you recognize that all of your time belongs to him. That day, as well as the other days, because you do what he has distinctively told you to do on that day, recognizing that it all belongs to him and he can tell you whatever he wants. You show clearly that you recognize that he is the Lord. He can tell you what to do with your time. Sabbath observance had the, has the added benefit of reminding you that all of your time belongs to the Lord. It makes you more mindful of what you're doing on the other days, what I talked about before, that maybe there's things you're doing that are using up more time than they should, that there should be more time working or more time spending with your family or more time something else that you're, you're encroaching on other things. You question, is it really for the Lord what you're doing? It helps in the same way that tithing helps. When you give the 10% that he calls you to give, it reminds you that the other 90% belongs to him as well. It doesn't make you think, oh, the other 90% doesn't, or it shouldn't. It doesn't belong to him. It's only this 10%. No, it all belongs to him. And therefore, you give the 10% that he asks. You're submitting to his authority as Lord. So is he your Lord? Does, is he the master of your time? Is he the master of your, your money, of your income? Now let's move on to the third reason for keeping the Sabbath day holy. Because of his, the Lord's, own example of resting on the seventh day. Now this is really at the heart of it all. We rest from our work and celebrate his work on the Sabbath because he rested from his work and celebrated the completion of his work on the Sabbath. He set the pattern when he created the world. In Genesis 1, we're told how he made everything in six days. And then in Genesis 2, we're told how he rested on the seventh day and sanctified the seventh day because he stopped or rested from his work. In other words, he enshrined it as a holy day. He set it as a holy day by his example. The day was sanctified as a day of celebration of finished work. We are told in Scripture how God and the holy angels rejoiced when the work of creation was finished. We are to follow His example each Sabbath day. We are to rejoice in His marvelous work of creation. We are to give thanks to Him and we are to honor Him for His work and for all that He has done for us. In Deuteronomy 5, God gives His people another of His great works to rejoice in on the Sabbath day. I've already talked about this really uh, you remember me talking about it a few weeks ago. I mentioned it today, too, in the short review that we did. When he issues his commandments in Deuteronomy 5, he calls them to a different reason. Do you remember that? From creation. He changes the reason. Not that creation is no longer a reason, but he gives them another reason. It's from the rejoicing in his finished work of bringing them out of Egypt. The Sabbath is the day that we're to honor for him for that great work. Deuteronomy 5.15 says... And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Isn't it interesting that God, who did the work for us of redemption, rejoices in the work. He loves that he has redeemed his people and that he's accomplished this work. And then he has to tell us, you guys need to rejoice in this too. <laughs> well, 
It was done for us. We should be the ones that would, would rejoice in it all the more. He finished this great work of delivering them from bondage. He rested from it. And he said, this, is, this calls for celebration. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, it does. Uh, so, so we're to finish our work. He says, finish all your work, set it apart, join me in celebrating. Uh, they, they are enter into the joyful rest that God has for his people. And now for us in the New Testament, what we read in Hebrews 4, we have the example of the Son of God incarnate resting from his work of redemption. His great work of the cross to atone for our sins is the work of the, and the subject of the book of the epistle to the Hebrews. And in Hebrews 4.10 that we read, the rest of Jesus from his great work is compared to God's rest from his work of creation. Jesus rested when he was finished with his work of redemption, just as God rested when he was finished with his work of creation. It says, for he, that is Jesus, who has entered his rest, has himself also ceased from his works, atoning for our sins as God did for his, from his. If we've come to Jesus and have been saved from our sins through this great work on the cross, then we're to follow his example also of celebrating the, on the Lord's Day. We do our work each week and then keep a Sabbath rest in which we rejoice with Jesus in the completion of his work as well as the completion of our work. As Hebrews 4.9 says, there remains a rest, a sabbatismos for the people of God. Follow his example of resting by resting yourself. Follow his example of rejoicing in that rest by rejoicing in the great work that he has done. Now we come to the fourth reason that we are, have for remembering the Sabbath day, because the Lord has blessed the Sabbath day. This is taken from that phrase in the fourth commandment that reads, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. As I have mentioned before, when the Lord blesses a day, I mentioned that even today, that that, that um, means that he makes it a blessing for us. You can see this with other things. If he blesses your marriage, it means that he makes it pleasant for you and good for you. Marriage in the abstract doesn't get blessed. It becomes a blessing to you. If he blesses a farmer's field, it means that he causes it to produce a good harvest. The field doesn't care, but the people who planted the crop care. When, he, when we ask him to bless our food at our meals, we're asking him to cause the food to nourish us and do us good. I'm not sure that the, uh, the, the cow that you're eating, the steak that you're having necessarily got blessed so much, but, but he, does, he blesses it for your sake. In the same way, when uh, God blesses the Sabbath, he is not doing something good for it. He is doing something good for us. We who keep the Sabbath. He's making that day useful and a blessing to us. Jesus made this very clear when he said Matthew or, or Mark 2:27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The day has no intrinsic value for itself, but it has value for us. By saying it was made for us, Jesus does not mean that it was made for us to do whatever we want, but he means it was made for our benefit and blessing. Now, since the Lord has promised to bless the Sabbath day, that ought to encourage you quite a lot to keep it. If you got some money and you were going to go into business and you had five different businesses that you were thinking of getting involved in, and if you had a prophecy from God, if you had a revelation from God, and you knew ahead that God was going to bless, that he would bless one of those businesses, say the lemonade stand that you were going to uh, start with that, with that money that you got, would you then do the shoe sales instead or the lawn service instead? Or would you do the thing that you knew that God was going to bless, the, the lemonade stand? Of course, you would do the lemonade stand unless you're stupid. You would be an absolute idiot not to do the thing that you know that God said that he would bless. Why would you do something that he is not said that he would bless when he's told you what he would bless? 
It doesn't make any sense at all. You would show that you did not believe God's promise. Well then, even if there were no other reasons for keeping the Sabbath day, if you are trying to decide what to do on the Lord's day, this one should be enough. If you knew that God had promised to bless that day, if you kept it holy, why would you decide to do something else? There's no reason. You would be an idiot to set aside the Lord's day and have a recreation day or a work day when God's blessing was in keeping the day holy to him. And what is the blessing that you ought to seek on that day? Well, I'll give you a few. The blessing of knowing your Creator and your Redeemer better. God makes Himself known on the Sabbaths especially. He's appointed it for that. The blessing of grasping more fully the greatness of His work and the benefits of it. It's a day when He reveals the glory of His works. That's what we talk about, the works of creation, the works of redemption. Number three, the blessing of lifting your soul up to Him, of being elevated to before the throne of God, to especially on that day, to, to praise Him and to thank Him. Surely you want to praise Him. Number four, the blessing of having your love and devotion to God stirred up. That often is something, that, a blessing of the Lord's day. Number five, the blessing of being encouraged by others in the Lord, especially by the Lord Himself. You miss the encouragement when you don't keep the Sabbath. Number six, the blessing of inviting others to come and learn of God's saving grace. Number seven, the blessing of bringing your children to worship our great God and to stand next to them and to your spouse in praising God and in sitting at his feet. It's a wonderful thing. Our children, we tell them to do things and now they see us like they're praising God and honoring God and that we're before God and that we're under God. And it, 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 it's an example to them that we have, especially when we gather on the Lord's Day. Number eight, the blessing of being taught in the way of the Lord and strengthened in that teaching. It's a day of instruction for us. Number nine, the blessing of being shown of your sin and brought to repentance so you can walk in greater conformity to his will. How many times does the Lord convict us of sin that we needed to be, deal with? when we're in the assembly. Number 10, the blessing of keeping the Lord and his work in fresh focus before you as you renew your vows each week and you remember his marvelous works. You're invigorated for your service to him. You're given an extra juice, you might say, from the Lord's day. Number 11, the blessing of receiving fuller measures of God's spirit. He delights to give the Holy Spirit on the Lord's Day as he did on that first Pentecost when on the first day of the week he poured out his Spirit on his church. It's a pattern that would continue thereafter. Number 12, the blessing of knowing that you have done the will of God. The assurance that comes when you have done what he commanded you to do. Number 13, the blessing of seeking the Lord in prayer for yourself and for others and have joined together in corporate prayer with others and for others. Number 14, the blessing of remembering that life is more than mere work and play, that our Lord is at the center of it all, that he is the Lord of creation and the savior of the world. That's a blessing. Everything's not the same. Some things are far more important than other things and you get that sorted out when you observe the Lord's day. This is important. Worship is important. This is more important than other things that I might do. Perhaps we could sum up his promise by quoting from Isaiah 58, 13 through 14 again. We looked at this one before in this study, where he says to us, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your, ple your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him not doing your own ways nor finding your own pleasure nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
So, is that what you want? Is that the kind of thing that you want? Or do you want something else? Remember that turning your foot away uh, from the Sabbath doesn't mean that you don't keep the Sabbath, enter into the Sabbath keeping, but it means that you don't track in with your own works, as it goes on to say. You're, you're bringing your, your muddy feet across the carpet of the Sabbath day, so to speak. You're profaning the day and making it a common and ordinary day when it's supposed to be a holy day. You turn those muddy feet away and you, you don't trample on it, but you rather observe it, not doing your own works, but doing God's. So in conclusion, consider the four things that we've seen today as reasons to keep the Sabbath day holy. Because he has given you six days to do everything else, and that's quite enough unless you're given to idols. Because, sec second, because he has claimed a special ownership of the day. He is your Lord and your master. He is the Lord of all our days, but this day is to be used this way. Number three, because he has given you an example, he has finished his work and celebrated. So you're to finish your work each week and celebrate with him in his works. Number four, because he has promised to bless the day to you. And you're an idiot if you know that there's a blessing on that day and you go and do something else. Why? Why? Because you don't believe. So those are the four reasons that we're given. Please stand and let's ask God to, to help us with this. Lord, how we thank you that you have given us your gracious instruction about keeping the Lord's Day holy. We, we come to you as a people who have been redeemed by you, that you are our Lord and our God and our Redeemer. And we ask you, O oh Lord, because of that, that you would be gracious to us and help us. For we know that we don't keep the Sabbath as we should. We know that we come short in keeping it. But Father, we pray that having all these reasons that you have graciously given us, that it would motivate us, that we would begin to pursue excellence about the Sabbath, and that we would call the day a delight, that we would find joy in observing it. Father, that we would know the blessing that comes from doing what you have told us to do. Truly, Lord, this is the day when we sit under the apple tree, when we sit under the shadow of your almighty care, when we especially recognize ourselves as under your protection. and we, we betake ourselves to you, Lord. We cast ourselves upon you as our Lord and our Redeemer. And it's a day when we eat of the sweet fruits that you provide for your people. When we have a feast of those fruits, more than we do on other days. We remember that there was a double offering that was made on the Lord's Day in the Old Testament. Well, we should have a double offering too. Not the blood of bulls and goats, but we come to you in Jesus' name. We offer the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to your name as a sacrifice of praise and the offerings of, uh, that we give in our hand, Lord, to you in response to you with gratitude for what you have done. So please, Lord, work in us and help us to truly become a people who do rejoice in the day that you've given us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive now the blessing of the Lord our God. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen.